Hey, Mike here with Canadian Musician. Right now in the Sheridan, I think it's called the Sheridan Gateway Hotel here in Pearson Airport in Toronto, where the fellow next to me has just arrived. Uh, fans of the outdoors may recognize him already. Les Stroud, um, maybe better known as Survivor Man, but also a very prominent activist and musician on top of a uh, nature adventurer and survival expert. And uh, he is now out with his fifth album, uh, Lake Bittern and uh, comes out, well, it's June 2nd, this Friday. Uh, folks may be seeing this interview after it's out, so uh, I'll say it's now out mm -hmm. in that case. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Les, I've always been a big fan of this show, and I'm really enjoying this new album because I was able to hear a bit of a okay. advanced uh, digital copy of it. So uh, thank you for doing this. How are you doing, man? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm, I'm ostensibly, as always, on a roll. I never know where the roll's going to take me, but I'm still on a roll. So obviously you're probably... Oh, you know, obviously you're best known as Survivor Man. The show has gave you a inter not just in Canada, an international prominence. But folks may not know that your musical background goes well be uh, back well beyond the start of uh, the Survivor Man series. Um, just to give some folks context for your musical career, can you just give us a bit of background on what you were doing musically pre-Survivor Man? Oh wow! Well, I mean, the original inspiration hit when I was 14 years old, you know, yeah. and, and I discovered rock and roll sort of, sort of thing. Um, I did that for a good 10 years, you know, training in the recording industry in Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, learning how to record music and so on, uh, becoming a songwriter. I started writing as soon as I was 14, playing in the Toronto band scene in the 80s. I played with a band called New Regime. Uh, we got a we got a, a deal with um, RCA at the time, um, just as I quit, uh, <laughs> and uh, a David Bowie cover band called the Diamond Dogs. So, I mean, I was I was totally doing all of the musical things yeah. that you'd want to do to you know, <laughs> to be Neil Young, to become a rock star, you know, uh, in the '80s. But it, but it was about uh, the mid '80s when I pulled away from. Yeah my musical endeavors through disillusionment to be honest right. and and just focused entirely on adventure hmm. that's interesting you say through disillusionment but you say you left the band just as you guys had signed a deal with rca um to most that would seem like the the time when uh you know hopes are at their highest or you know however you may put it um sorry that maybe started in this place but no, i'm just no. I, but uh just with that, I'm curious. Well, why did this illusion at that at that point at that age? I think uh, I, I suffer from an artistic uh, malady. I, I I like to think of myself as an artist, and I like to think of art first. And but music business is a business, and entertainment business is a business, and it's always like it's been a struggle I've had since the mid '80s with music that I never shook during the, uh, all my time being Survivor Man. And it's that problem of trying to be really real mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry. <laughs> you already see where I'm going with it, yeah. right? And, you know, I, I, I look up to you know, people like Bruce Coburn and that who achieved that. Well, in the 80s, I still found power in the acoustic guitar and power in the singer-songwriter and power in rock and roll. But in the mid-80s, that was all dead. That was, you know, dinosaur rock and all of that, and nobody wanted that anymore, and it became synthesizer. Nobody knew how to perform on stage either. Bands like Duran Duran didn't even know how to perform. I hated that. I really hated that. And so when I say disillusionment, it's because I was at my peak. I was writing for record labels, ready to... And then the mid-'80s hit, and I just did not... I didn't connect with Spandau Ballet and Depeche Mode and all of that, not, notwithstanding their talent. It wasn't for me, so that's when I said, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm checking out. Yeah. yeah. You say you're looking for something real. Um, the show was as real, real as it gets. Was that giving you something creatively, artistically, some kind of satisfaction that music wasn't giving you then? Like, how, how quickly was that, trans that transition? That's a great question. Uh, it wasn't quick. What I did was I abandoned music. I didn't even touch my guitar for eight years, and I became... An earlier hero of mine, I became Jacques Cousteau, I became Tarzan, I became, uh, you know, uh, Jim Fowler in, in Wild, on Wild Kingdom. I wanted all of that. So I, you know, eschewed anything creatively and musically, like, like going down that endeavor and just became this other thing, this adventurer, this outdoor Canadian guide, this canoeist and hiker and sea kayaker and dog sledder. That's what I became. So during that period, for a good solid, you know, another, the next 10 years, yeah. The creativity didn't really, it just stayed in here. Yeah. But it, it was always eking to get out, and it was 
that desire to be creative, to express myself creatively, that eventually brought me back to music while I was, you know, also becoming Survivor Man. Yeah. Yeah. You've told the story about um, being in Whitehorse mm -hmm. to film Survivor Man when, uh, for the first time in a long time, you got up on stage and you know pulled out the harmonica. And I think you, as you tell the story, you uh, pulled out the harmonica, played along with a bar band to Long Tall Sally, and realized how much you would missed it. I just wonder how long had that gap been at that point before that that reignited the flame. So that would be like ten, eleven years, because that was ninety. Seven-ish that I was in. It was in. It was Yellowknife, actually. You almost got the names Sorry. correct. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you a full full disclosure fact fact check. So it was Yellowknife, and it was Mustang Sally. Close. Not. You said Long Tall Sally. Long Tall Sally. It was Mustang Sally, and it. But it was definitely blowing harp up on stage. And what happens? I don't have notes in front of me. Yeah. Well. I'll tell you, I, 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 was def I was walking along and I saw Blues Jam, Thursday night, The Cave Club, Big Dave McLean was a, a prominent Winnipeg blues man, actually. And I thought, oh, oh, I kinda, I, maybe I missed that. And yeah, the second I was on stage, now I was not yet Survivor Man, but I was fully ensconced in being an outdoor guide. I was, okay. I was a pro, I was teaching survival, I was running dog teams, all that. I was the woodsman, yeah. you know, in all its cliche greatness. <laughs> but the music beckoned, and, and the minute I started playing music, I realized, well, wait a minute, I'm still a writer. Once a writer, never, you, you, you never stop being a writer. Yeah. And I went home that night. There was an old guitar in the corner. I was, I was literally looking after a dog team. Uh, and, uh, and I picked up the guitar, and within an hour I'd written a song, and I thought, wow, yeah. Not only did I miss the stage and jamming out with the blues and my, my, my love of performing, I missed writing. And so I, I let it seep back into my life, but it was adventure that was winning the day, certainly economically. At that point already, and you may see where I'm going this with this and the connection to the new album. But at that point, when you repicked, when you picked up the guitar and began writing again, did you notice an influence from the survival work you had been doing in the music you were then doing the second time around? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the lyrics. I wrote a song called uh, "Ride On," and the, I mean. Uh, um, and that's what it's about. It's about breaking free of the city and turning to nature. It, I mean, certainly I would go on to write more love songs again, but it was this concept of writing about the wilderness, about connecting to nature. Uh, I, I went and saw Ian Tamblin and thought, man, this guy's doing great. What beautiful music. And he was doing that kind of thing. I started listening to Stan Rogers and Bruce Coburn again. And everything that had to do with music that connected you to nature and it was me being Survivor Man, or me teaching survival and all that stuff. It was a no-brainer, and it was, an, it was not a stretch. The, the words were there, the concepts were there, the trees were there, and so the songs were there. Now, to get to the new album, Lake Bittern. Um, Bittern Lake. Oh, Bittern. Bittern. I thought it was Lake, no, okay. Lake. I'm okay. mixing Lake up all the words Lake today. Bittern, Bittern Lake, it's the same place. <laughs> Bittern Lake, mixing up all the words today. That's okay. the, um, but the, it, it's a concept album of sorts i guess you could say it's certainly it's certainly a thematic album um a mixture of covers and originals all revolving around the theme of conservation and protecting the environment protecting uh protecting our world um when did this thematic element of the album it, it seems obvious for everyone who knows who you are and knows the show and it's obvious where your love of the environment comes from but to make a thematic uh album like this um essentially when did that start coming together well, uh, without convoluting the story, I was actually working on a different album that I have yet to release. It was a fairly uh, ambitious studio album, and through that process I met Mike Klink. And Mike Klink is a, is a legendary rock producer. He made the Guns N' Roses sound, you know, Metallica's, and they're ostensibly the biggest album, um, you know, with Rod Stewart, and on and on it goes, uh, Beth Hart and so on. And Mike and I connected through an old friend of mine, and... I think Mike really appreciated the opportunity to work on music that had rock sensibilities, acoustic sensibilities, roots, folk sensibilities, whatever you like, but that had a message that wasn't, you know, boy meets girl, boy loses girl. Mm -hmm. And that my message, he hopefully thought, had integrity mm -hmm. to it. So Mike and I started working on this more ambitious studio album, and then I started telling him about, well, you know, Mike, 
every two years I go in and I record an album live off the floor, all the musicians one room, you should come by and check it out. And I recorded the pre predecessor album and he came by and hung out and he loved it and he said, well, if you do another one, let me know and let's, let's make it thematic, let's yeah. stick with your theme. In fact, he challenged me because I had a couple of love songs in there and he goes, no. He goes, no, they're okay, Les, but let's stick with the theme. And so Mike Klink was uh, uh, very, he, he was a large figure in, in keeping me on the theme. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't instant, in, instinctively want to be on that theme, but I'm an artist, so I meander, and he kept me focused. Now, your willingness to go down that road and pursue that theme across the entire album, was that from a point of personal passion and connection just like from a more personal point of view or was it from a more macro level of, um, essentially political point of view you look around right now what's happening in the world um, and it seems like every day you know there's louder and louder alarm bells that scientists are ringing well you know the other day Trump signed another damn bill where he's allowing miners to dump waste into a river and it seems like we're getting that yeah, kind don't, of don't tell me that seems like we're getting that kind of news every day so yeah. I'm just wondering was was the motivation personal or was it political or both you know I think if I were to percentage eyes it if that's a word you know I would say pr prompt predominantly personal but the political motivates it mm -hmm. you know the political is frustrating it's hard because you're up against a big beast and it feels like a losing battle but the personal was me being on the side of a river in Indonesia that's you know covered with garbage the personal is me being in Tomogamy Ontario and, and and wondering why the campsites are empty where the people go why aren't they up here seeing this you know so the personal is experienced and lived by me every single day and that that prompts my lyrics uh, and my and my thought, you know, train of thought when I write something, but I could never divorce it from the political as well. The political is what pisses me off. Mm -hmm. So the lead song, how long? That's you know, I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, come on. It was like one of those moments. Yeah. You know, it really is a combination of both yeah. personal and political. Sorry, sorry, I have to. Oh, <laughs> you got to cut. You gotta Pause. You got it. Thanks very much. We do. Also, I can't the name of a mid-80s <laughs> Canadian music star. As we're talking about Trump, I'm watching the headlines here on CP24, and oh. just can't believe that Doug Ford could be the premier. And it's like, really? After the last two years of watching Trump, have Is we Doug not? Ford the premier? Doug Ford could become the premier. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Don't even. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this and this is this is this is the the. the yeah, we're fucked. <laughs> it's it's really frustrating. Uh, um, yeah, God, it's frustrating. It's so hard to go down that road because there's so many directions that go. So, and, and you know, <laughs> nice segue back to my album. This is why I try to focus where I'm at on the environment. That's yeah. what I know. Yeah. You want me to talk about nuclear arms race? I don't really know. Yeah. You want me to talk about certain things to do with Trump or Doug Ford and what's going to... I don't really know. But the minute they start hitting the environment, I do know. Yeah. I've been probably to what they're talking about. I drove through the Escalante region the day before Trump decommissioned it or whatever he did. You know, I was literally there the day before. That's... That's what I know, and Survivor Man was part of me knowing all that, yeah. getting around the world and, and, and really connecting to the environment. Uh, like I mentioned, this album is a combination of covers and originals. Mm -hmm. um, for the cover, you include songs by J.J. Kale, um, Joni Mitchell, um, a lesser known song by J.J. Kale, but the Joni Mitchell song is, of course, a big yellow taxi, though the interpretation of it is very different than one may expect. Mm -hmm. um, the acoustic guitars are gone, even the melody is totally different. I believe you even change a verse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, with trepidation. <laughs> with trepidation. When, uh, when it came to choosing those covers, was it more just a matter of a lyrical connection which needed to be there for the album, or was there something more to the process of chart ch choosing the right songs that you wanted to cover? No, the lyrical connection had to be there. Look, there's there's a number of songs that have sort of uh, claimed to be environmental or, yeah. oriented songs, and, and many of them are quite beautiful and powerful. I remember listening to, I think it was Crosby, Stills and Nash's Wales, mm. or Whale Song or something like that. Really beautiful songs. But uh, I need, you know, you listen and you need the song to speak to me. And the J.J. Kale song was a good was a case in point. That's a very obscure song. Yeah. Um, I was contacted by his his estate, who were thrilled that I covered it, and they were they were personally grateful. It was really wonderful to get that letter. Um, 
but the words didn't, they weren't, he didn't mince his words at all. And the song's called Death in the Wilderness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a hopeless case, I guess. Who's looking out for the wilder side? So I, uh, you know, I'll never be accused of being passive aggressive. That's for sure. Um, and and I, I could be accused sometimes of killing a house fly with a sledgehammer. It's just a, a malady that, that, that I, you know, it's a problem that I have. But when I hear lyrics that cut to the chase, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm like that. <laughs> and Death in the Wilderness with J.J. Kale was one of the, was, yeah. was definitely in there lyrical wise. Big Yellow Taxi, uh, it was certainly such a well known song. And, you know, as I say, sacrilege to change Joni's lyrics. Change Joni. Mitchell's lyrics. It's like changing Bob Dylan's yeah, lyrics. Like you can't that. do that, you know. <laughs> but I just thought. But I, I, you know, I even didn't include the Tree Museum verse because there wasn't enough time. It would have been a really long song. So, but the point is that that the lyrics, in spite of being one of the world's most famous environmental songs, it's all jangly guitar and Joni's vocals and I don't know who who else did it. They always yeah. the jangly guitar. The lyrics are dark, mm -hmm. and I thought. I'm, I'm going to let this song be dark. You really slowed it down, almost turned it into a, uh, almost like a talking blues sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a delta. I, well, I didn't know how to do it. I thought, I really like to do it, but how? Yeah. And one day I was playing slide guitar, and I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. And I thought, all right, you know, this delta blues dirge kind of feel mm -hmm. works for the lyrics. Mm -hmm. and, it, and when I sing it live, I still feel every word. I don't gloss over it because it's... It's slowed down, you know. Hey, farmer, put away your DDT. That's that's, it's still kind of scary when you yeah. think about a chemical yeah. that powerful. So the the long the shorter answer to your question about the process of picking the tunes was was they had to speak to me, you mm -hmm. know, like Bruce Coburn's "If a Tree Falls." Yeah. Now, with uh, with your originals, one of the things that stuck out to me is even though I'm you're aware and the you know the the, the theme we keep bringing up is there and it's obvious. It doesn't hit you over the head with it in a like pastiche or corny sense, know what I mean? Um, that's one of the things that I find often leads to the best protest songs, the best topical songs. There's ones that doesn't hit you over the head with it, but there's more nuance to it. And I found that that was there in your originals. I'm wondering how well crafted of a thing that was or how conscious of a thing that was for you. That's a great question because I was just reading something and about how blurry the line is between art and propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to be propaganda. I didn't want it to feel or seem contrived. I mean, that, that's been at the core of the, the, the film work I've done. I, I hate when things are contrived or derivative. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard for me as a musician not to be derivative with yeah. you know, 30 years of influence from modern pop music in my, in my soul. Fine, okay, I can accept that. I'm gonna play a G, C, and D chord. <laughs> They've been played before in that format, you know, in that, in that way. But, um, but the words are all me. The words are all mine. And they, I've been a wordsmith since I was 14 and I do love words. So in, certainly with the lyrical content, there's no faking it. I just say what I say. Mm -hmm. You either, you're behind it or you're not. You either yeah. get it or you don't. Yeah. And I think because of my attitude, it just won't come across as contrived. Like, oh, he's got a shtick here. He's in either that nature guy. So he's writing nature songs because he's a nature guy. <laughs> oh, I get it. That's a pretty cool shtick. Maybe he'll sell some records. That's not it. I mean, I, you know, I, I believe this stuff and I live this stuff. And so I just say it as I feel it. And then and there, there is no uh, contrived feeling to it. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned everything's live off the floor. I believe no overdubs. Um, uh, which isn't the easy route to go in recording an album with everything that's available these days. Um, I connect this to the way you film the show, where you're filming, there's no film crew or anything, you did the show, um, filming it all yourself, uh, up yourself. I've seen you say that probably like the most time consuming part of those treks was just, you know, getting the shots and that kind of stuff, because you were doing it as it appeared um, on the show. It wasn't, uh, not to start throwing mud here, but it wasn't Bear Gillis or Grills or whatever the hell his name is. Okay, you can get his name wrong, it's better that way. <laughs> Ex exactly, yeah. Um, so essentially what I'm getting at is, is there a, is a personality element to you where you wanted, you kind of want to do stuff the hard way? Oh, that was going to be my line and you just, yeah, you just nailed it. It's, it's I, I had a friend say, let's just, always seems to want to do things the hard way and I, what is this i don't know what it is 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 it the challenge um that i feel with it you know i'll digress to 
a, a poet, a, an artist I admire, who, who, who said, you know, uh, he's never ever wanted a walk-on part in the war. He wanted to be in the trenches. Uh, you know, which, which was Roger Waters said that, you know, to this day, you can see him well up with tears in his eyes talking about, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be in the trenches meaningfully. And um, I think I aspire to that. I think I, I feel the same, you know, survivor man's all around the world. Um, I just came off of a not so pleasant experience working with National Geographic. You'd think, right? Oh, it's not... Nah, and why, why did I fight? Because I was the one guy saying, but this isn't real. Are we doing this for real? Well, yeah, but that's so hard and takes so much time. What's your point? That's me, I'm, I'm that thorn in the side, you know? I, 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 I have a lot of wonderful friends, but I don't, I think I lose some friends because maybe I pride myself on being the one guy in the room saying, hey, does everybody see the purple elephant sitting over here? Let's talk about them. I'm that guy, right? So, which makes me an asshole, I think, a lot of times, unfortunately. But isn't it the way, sometimes, that the one person who's willing to say, we all said we were going to stick to this level of integrity, mm -hmm. and we're not doing it. That's the guy who gets labeled as the asshole. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is easier. We'll make more money. Yeah. I, I hate that. <laughs> I hate it. And I, and I never got into any of this for money. So, yeah. I, I some For whatever reason, I do things the hard way. That's cool. It's a lot of... Uh Admiration in that. The, uh, it's not much money. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the music industry, it's good to not be doing it for money. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. The uh, music industry too. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, of course, you're a very good singer, a very good guitar player. But anyone who watches the show, people who've seen you live, know you're an exceptional harmonica player. Um, I'm wondering, was that something that you that came out of your time in the wilderness because the harmonica is just such a convenient instrument to bring with you? No, that's the cliche. Okay. And that's almost like asking me, if you ask me, though, how were you raised? Oh, I was raised by wolves. <laughs> yeah, that's what the Survivor Man fan wants yeah. to hear, right? In fact, I was raised in the suburbs of Toronto listening to Sticks and Super Tramp, drinking beer. So, you know, so uh, the harmonica... I think we all... I think all musicians have a physicality to them where they take to certain things, be it keyboards or stringed instruments or vocalizing or wind instruments wind instruments. I have always taken to wind instruments. I can pick up a flute and have it within moments or recently I picked up the clarinet. Within the first 15 minutes I was playing a scale on the clarinet without squawking. So I, wind instruments in me are a good connection. Stringed instruments in me, I can hack out a solo and make it look like I'm okay but it's hard, you know, it's labor. But the harmonica I did use it for survival. I did play it to scare away bears. I have had it on camping trips, but the reality is blues, yeah. blowing the blues, and, and and showing up with just this in my hand, you know, and being able to jump around the stage. I just really took to that instrument, and um, it's all there's a physicality in the shape of the mouth and the lungs and the lips, everything to whether or not it's for you. And it was for me. If you are bringing it uh, into the wild, I'm just wondering. Having that and that ability to play music when you're out there by yourself, whether it's for the show or, or just, you know, for your own things. Um, is there a, just how well does that help with morale and just really just keeping your sanity when you're out in the middle of nowhere by yourself, having the ability to play music? It's a great question. And my answer is 180 degrees the opposite. Really? I purposely don't take instruments other than the odd time, the harmonica, and mostly that's if I'm going to be in bare territory alone. Yeah. Um, out to the wilderness. I have found that the bush, and this is the core message and core value I've been putting out in my music and my films for years, the bush doesn't need any help. The wilderness does what it needs to do for you. And when I go out, I prefer to be out there and let it just, I just came back, I, I'm literally coming to you after four and a half days backpacking in the Marble Mountains in Northern California. And I watched the pollen and everything fall off the trees, and I just let it do this. And I almost took a backpacker guitar with me. And my sensibility said, no, remember, Les, it's the wilderness. Just be out there. So that's what I do. I just go out the wilderness, and I just be. Then later, sitting at the coffee table with a glass of wine and a candle burning and a guitar in my hand and noodling around with some open tuning or something, 
uh, I'll remember and I'll let it per it's percolated through me at that point and that's when I write so out there I don't need to play music yeah. I, I, I hate to be asked the question well if you could only have one what would it be because uh, it would probably be the wilderness and I hate saying that because I I'm so passionate about music yeah, yeah. well on the theme of music, while we close up here, uh, where are you going to be playing music when you're not uh, in the mounds? As much as I can right now. Uh, it's been a very interesting endeavor getting me into places. I, I push the agents hard to say, you know what, I'll play for anybody, anywhere. I don't need a 2,000-seater. I'll play to 12 people in a house concert. I just want to play. So I've got uh, the Gaming Center in uh, Ontario coming up on June... Uh, 15th I believe it is uh, I'm playing with Journey tomorrow night Really? yeah blowing harp I go with uh, I play once a year with Journey with Johnny Lang with Dave Mason I I met them through the survivor man kind of thing and I go up and I get a cameo appearance I play love and touch and squeeze them with Journey That's cool. is that crazy <laughs> um, I played Roadhouse Blues with uh, Robbie Krieger of the Doors you know okay. so uh, yeah That's so I get cool. those little cameo things but I am working on developing as many tours right now uh, in both south of the border and also throughout Canada, we're working on a Midland concert for, um, I want to say, October 28th in Midland. Uh, Gaming Center is much cl sooner, is in June uh, 15th uh, at the Gaming Center. Uh, wonderful conservation area. And that type of gig is really appropriate for me, to play at a conservation center. Uh, so in the States, for example, I'm doing one in Bend, Oregon, where the night before, you can go see kayaking with Survivor Man. So 40 people go see kayaking with me, and I tell them Survivor Man stories. The next night, concert at the Tower Theatre in Bend. If I could do that all across Canada, yeah. go visit a conservation area like Gaming, yeah. speak the night before or the morning after, yeah. and do a concert, it's perfect. It's, it's just such a no-brainer. And it's not me trying to fill Massey Hall or any yeah. theatre. It's, it's just in keeping. And it's the music and nature all combined. Yeah. Well, the new album, uh, Bitter and Lake, will be out by the time folks uh, see this. And Les, I've uh, been a fan of you for a while, so this is a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I just want to remind, too, that with the Bitter and Lake album, two new uh, videos will be airing, one for How Long, one for Big Yellow Taxi, both directed by Matt Mahern, who did U2, all of Tom Waits, Disturbed, Sound of Silence, Metallica is a master uh, director. Those come out at the same time, and they're beautiful videos. Fantastic. Check them out. Thanks, Les. Thank you. Cheers.